Hello and welcome to the NPTEL MOOCs course on design and implementation of human computer interfaces. Today we are going to start the course with the first topic that is an general introduction to the interactive systems and a brief history. Before we begin, let us understand the scope of this course. So, here we are going to talk about design and implementation of interactive systems. In other words, we will be actually talking about how to engineer quote unquote engineer an interactive system. So, there are two things involved here. One is interactive system or software specifically computer software that are interactive. So, we are going to focus here entirely on software that are interactive. What are interactive software? We will soon learn about those. Second concept that is important here is the word engineering. So, here we actually refer to the fact that such software can be developed in a very systematic manner involving stages and we are going to learn about those stages. Given the scope of the course, let us begin with the major or the primary concept that is involved here that is interactive software or interactive system in general where we will be implicitly referring to software whenever we are going to use the term interactive system. Now, these interactive systems whenever we mention this term automatically a question comes to our mind why we are labeling certain software as interactive and how these are different from other software. Let us try to understand this a little bit in depth. So, let us begin with the very concept of computer. Whenever we mention the term computer, what comes to our mind? For those who are part of an earlier generation, the term computer immediately brings to mind desktop or laptops most likely. For younger generation, the term computer may also refer to along with desktop and laptop may also refer to smartphones or tabs or even some wearable devices. Now, this desktop, laptop, smartphone, tabs are these only the examples of computers? Let us see. The answer is an unequivocal no there are many more computers that we may be using without being aware of them. In fact, we are surrounded by such computers. Let us see one simple example, a digital pedometer. Is it a computer? To understand this question or to answer this question, let us first go by the definition of a computer. What is a computer? According to Oxford English Dictionary, a computer is an electronic device which is capable of receiving information or data in a particular form and of performing a sequence of operations in accordance with a predetermined but variable set of procedural instructions which is also known as program to produce a result in the form of information or signal. So, in a nutshell, a computer takes some input, applies some program to convert it to some output and the program performs some operation on this input. And this program is pre-stored somewhere. Now, let us come back to digital pedometer, whether it is a computer or not. So, what a pedometer does? The main objective of a pedometer is to identify that the wearer is walking or not. Of course, nowadays pedometers also have many other features, but let us focus only on the 
key function of a digital pedometer which is trying to determine the walking speed and the walking distance. So, essentially it tries to identify whether you are walking or not. Now, in order to do that it must differentiate between walking and standing. How a device can do that? When we are trying to do it we visually see the movement and then accordingly our brain produces the understanding whether somebody is standing or walking. But in the case of a digital pedometer how it can do that? That is one issue. Second issue is that typically digital pedometers are uh, known to keep count of number of steps. So, that is another function, but as you may understand or as you may uh, try to understand, counting the number of steps is not an easy task, because you are likely to walk at different speeds at various instants of time. In fact, as a thought exercise you can yourself try to do it, try to count the number of steps that you are performing while walking and you will understand the difficulty involved. So, the pedometer first tries to understand that you are walking then it tries to count the number of steps and finally, from the number of steps it tries to compute the total distance covered. So, how it does that? It has to know some formula for this conversion and based on that formula it can perform the conversion. So, this formula has to be somewhere in the device. So, there are two things involved one is trying to understand whether you are walking then counting the steps and then converting it to a distance and the second thing is storing the relevant formulae as well as performing the actual computation. So, if we now try to compare the activities of a pedometer with the definition of a computer we will see that pedometer accepts as input some sensory information processes it based on an algorithm which is nothing but those set of formulae and based on that algorithm it produces some output which is the distance covered or the walking speed etcetera. So, it perfectly fits the definition of a computer. So, digital pedometer we can say is a computer. Let us see another example microwave oven many of us might have seen this in our kitchen. So, is it a computer? Now, if we look inside the oven, we will see that it consists of various components broadly. These are the components you are likely to find inside a microwave oven, a magnetron tube, turntable plate, beeper, door, front panel, display and light these are the components and then there is some embedded hardware and software to operate these peripheral devices as well as generate certain output using those devices. So, here also we can see that it receives some input say for example, input from this front panel in terms of temperature duration, then it produces some output on the display as well as some sound output and it performs certain operations depending on the input provided based on stored program. So, it also is an example of a computer as per definition. A third example is a smart TV, whether it can be considered as a computer or not. Here also there are lots of components involved. Let us have a look at the software or the smart TV app 
which can be understood in terms of a layered view of the software where you have HTML, CSS, JavaScript layer, media layer and so on and so forth. So, the user provides some input to the app through some interface, then the TV itself has this software which is connected to some servers to fetch information and then that information is processed and displayed on the screen. Again, it takes input processes based on stored program and produces output. So, as per definition this also is a computer. So, these examples show that we are surrounded by computers. Now, all these are actually examples of interactive computing systems and the interaction takes place between the computer and the user. Now, the most important fact here is that these users are not experts, these users are layman users. Anybody can be the user of a digital pedometer or a microwave oven or a smart TV without any specific qualification. So, that is the defining characteristics of any interactive system or interactive software or interactive computing system that these are systems that are to be used or interacted with by a user who is a layman user who does not have any specific qualification to be a user of the system. So, whenever we will be using the term interactive system we will be referring to such systems where layman users are the users of the system rather than somebody who has special training to use the system. Now, this brings us to the next question that we should try to answer. Is it necessary for the users to know about the technology behind? So, I said that for an interactive system users need not have any specific qualification. In that case to operate or to interact with an interactive system does the user need to have any specific technological knowledge. Let us see another example. Some of you may be familiar with this type of display. It used to come in some earlier operating system version where there used to be some error messages displayed in this form. So, this is actually an example of an error message produced by an operating system which used to be there some time ago. What it says that there is a header which says system error status some number which is actually in hexadecimal code. And then what it says is that a particular system, a particular app or application initialization failed because some device attached to the system is not functioning, click OK to shut down and reboot into safe mode. Check the event log for more details and there is only one button to select which is OK. So, whether you like it or not you have to press OK to move forward. Now, what this message actually tells us? If I do not know anything about these terms or what is a hexadecimal code, what is event log, what is system accounts manager or security accounts manager, I will not understand anything from this message. Although it is shown to a user of the system, but the user is expected to have certain level of knowledge as is evident from this particular output. Now, if I do not have that knowledge, then I am not going to be able to figure out what is the error and what I am supposed to do. So, that will lead us, lead me as a user to anxiety. Did I do something wrong? What is that wrong thing I do, did? How to get out of it? And should we refrain from performing any more things, so that 
such error messages do not come again and again. That is the anxiety that I will have if I do not know the meaning of those messages. Now, this anxiety or these type of confusions in the mind of the user may lead to the loss of motivation which is very important, loss of motivation for further use. In effect, this will make the user think that such systems are not for me to use, so rather I should not use it, which actually will defeat the whole purpose of making the system used by the users. So, these, these concerns where we want to avoid the user being forced to lose motivation or being forced to have confusion because certain knowledge is not there, these concerns actually brings us to this important concept of user centric design. The principal objective for interactive systems should be that the system should not force users to learn about the underlying technology. That should be the guiding principle for any interactive system. Otherwise, the user will not be motivated to use the system. So, accordingly the system should be designed. Now, the main concern here is how to design the systems so that users find it easy to use. So, that is the main challenge to a interactive system designer. In order to have a better understanding of this challenge, let us discuss an example system, which is ubiquitous, most of us have seen it. This is an example of a TV remote control. Now, probably all of us have used one of such remote controls. What are the activities that are typically done with uh, such a device? We can control brightness, contrast, gamma correction and many more things with the device. We can input a channel number, typically 3 digits, but it may be different in different locations to select a particular channel. We can control voice level. We can do some certain other things like watch movies from external devices attached to the TV or watch or view photos or watch videos from our digital camera after attaching it to the TV and all these things we can do by interacting with the TV through this remote control. So, in the example remote control that we are uh, discussing, let us see which portion deals with which of these activities. Now, this top region shown in red circle typically has uh, buttons for channel change, volume control. Additionally, it also has couple of buttons for uh, changing input source as well as power on off button. There is another group of buttons in the middle of the device which are used occasionally to navigate various menu options. And finally, there is a third group of buttons which are rarely used. In actually, many of us may not even be knowing what are the purpose of these buttons, what are the purposes of these buttons because either we never use them or use them so infrequently that we forgot. So, among these three groups, the first one involving buttons for channel change or volume control is likely to be the most frequently used group of buttons, whereas the third group of buttons is the least likely to be used buttons. But the thing is that in the same device all these buttons are provided. 
So, this third group actually supports many more functionalities which we may not require frequently. In fact, in most of the cases we never require it. Now, the thing to be noted here is that in the same device we have all the buttons are put on the same device. So, same device contains every control option conceivable and supported by the TV. What is the result for such a design? It actually succeeds in scaring away many potential users initially, but of course, since it is a very simple device, so with few days of usage people tend to learn, but again as I said this third group of buttons will never be learned because those are very infrequently used or not used at all. Whereas, the first group of buttons is likely to be remembered and used most frequently. So, what could have been done? Instead of designing it in this way, it could have been designed in such a way such that the most frequently used buttons are kept in a very prominent way and the least frequently used buttons are not given the same prominence as the most frequently used. That would have probably emphasized the relative weight of the or uh, relative uh, importance of the buttons to the users and accordingly the users would have tried to learn them. So, this example tells us that user centric design is very important where it refers to the process to design products which are computers in which the users needs and expectations are taken care of by considering their characteristics. So, we should know who are the users of this remote control, so li likely to be everybody, what are their needs and expectations as I have already mentioned mostly they require this first group of buttons. So, accordingly we should have designed and we probably should have kept the other buttons not in a very prominent position, so that the users would not have been intimidated by the presence of so many control options. So, this remote control we can think of as an interface to the television rather than the TV itself. Now, if we again consider this example, so since user centric design is our focus, so if we again consider this example, let us try to understand what we are trying to design, what we are trying to do differently, so that this product becomes user centric. Now, the remote contains buttons which we can call as elements of the interface, interface to a computer which is the TV. That is the first thing to note. Second thing is these buttons are placed in a particular way which actually defines a geometric layout of the interface. That is the second thing to note a geometric layout of the interface. Then when we interact with the TV using the remote, for example, to select a channel, we visually perceive the system state and its change from the TV screen or from the display. So, that is the third element of an interactive system. And finally, we continue performing the operation till we are sure that we achieved what we wanted. That is the system state matches with our goal state as per our perception. So, when we are talking of designing a user centric product or system, so there are four things we should consider. One is the interface elements, their geometric layout the perception of the system state and matching of the system state with our goal state. So, these are issues that we should be concerned about while going for designing a user centric system. That means, in other words, so four things we should take care of in user centric design. First thing is design the elements, 
that are acceptable to the users, note the word acceptable, then design layout that meet users expectations. So, any layout is not good. So, first we need to know the expectations of the users and accordingly we need to design it. Then help the user perceive the system state. So, design the display in such a way so that the state of the system from the user's point of view is easily understandable. And finally, design interaction that fulfills the needs of the users by taking them to the desired system states. So, design element, design layout, design display and design interaction. These four are the primary things that a designer of an interactive system should be aware of or should be conscious about while going for a user centric design. So, with that let us learn a little bit of how this field that user centric design field evolved over time. So, we will briefly mention about the milestones that have been achieved during this journey of last few decades. Okay, so, let us briefly learn about the historical evolution of this field of user centric design. So, this evolution we can broadly divide into four phases, four not very distinct, there will be some overlaps in these phases, but we can still broadly divide it into four phases. The first phase is the, we can term it as prehistory, which is the period between the 1940s to 1970s in the last century. This is before the advent of the so called personal computers. So, during this phase also as we will see several developments took place that advanced this field of user centric design. Then comes the early phase which is roughly from 1980s till the early 21st century which is or can be considered as the era of personal computers. Then the pre-modern phase late 1990s to the first decade of the 21st century. Now, during this phase widespread use of mobile personal computing devices have been observed notably smartphones and tablets. And finally, we can think of the modern age which is continuing which is the era of interconnected devices. Now, let us see what are the milestones that have been achieved in these four phases. In the prehistory phase that is between 1940s to 1970s before the advent of personal computer, we have several important milestones. So, in the 1950 the first video display unit came out is called the SAGE system. Then in 1963 one interesting system was developed called Sketchpad by Ivan Sutherland. Now, it introduced the idea of graphical user interfaces and the concept of interaction. Then came the online system or NLS proposed by Engelbart and team in 1968, which introduced an important interaction device, which is ubiquitous the mouse. The release of the first commercial microprocessor named Intel 4004 happened in 1971, which revolutionized the computing landscape. And finally, in 1972, one product was developed although it was not commercially very successful, the Dynabook by Alan Kay which is a precursor to the 
personal computers. As compared to this phase, the early phase had less number of milestones. It primarily consists of the early personal computers, Xerox Alto which came in 73, 1973, then Altair 8800, 1974, Apple 1, 1976 and Apple 2, 1977. The most impactful development happened in 1981 with the advent of IBM PC or personal computer. Then Xerox Star in 1981 also introduced the concepts such as graphical user interfaces, then we see we or what you see is what you get concept then the idea of metaphors which have profound impact in the development of user centric systems. Almost at the same time in 1982, the concept of direct manipulation came into being proposed by Ben Snederman. Then Apple Mac was released in 1984, again another important milestone in that phase. The idea of World Wide Web came about in 1989 and the first web browser was developed in 1993. So, all these actually have profoundly impacted the advent of the user centric design area. In the pre-modern phase, we had Palm Pilot in 1996 which is the first example of a successful mobile device, Nokia 9000 9, which came in 1996. Then in 2008 Android 1.0 was released which revolutionized the smartphone landscape. Also during this period other smart and intelligent consumer electronic products proliferated which again affected the advent of user centric design field. Finally, we came to the modern phase, although in this phase the smartphones are still there, but the main landmark event that happened is that now we are no longer talking about personal devices, a single device. Instead, we are now more concerned about connected devices in an ubiquitous computing environment where the devices are connected to each other to give better experience to the user. Now, this term was first proposed by Mark Weiser way back in 1991 and during this period some other related developments happened which are closely related to each other namely the development of internet of things or the rather the development of the concept of internet of things by Kevin Aston in 1999. Then the cyber physical system concept or CPS by Helen Gill in 2006. All these refer to the idea that now, the idea of personal computer has been changed from one user one computer to one user many computers where computers are not treated as computer rather they are treated as uh, any other real life daily uh, objects and we just use them like we use any other uh, objects in our daily life. So, we are actually using computers without being aware of the fact that they are computers. Now, this conceptual change happened in this modern phase which is still going on. So, with that we have come to the end of this first lecture. To recap, here in this lecture we learned about what is an interactive system, how it is different from other systems what are the issues that we should be aware of while going to design an interactive system and what is the basic idea of user centric design 
and a brief historical evolution of the field of user centric design. The material that I have covered today can be found from uh, this book. Have a look at chapter 1 section 1.1 to 1.3. So, that is all for today. See you in the next lecture. Thank you and goodbye. Thank you.